So Brian, every week we get together, we start planning the podcast, and then for some reason, we go eat Chipotle right before the podcast. So every time when I want to be crisp and ready to talk, I just want to take a nap instead. Go ahead, Ben. Take a nap. It's fine. Our listeners will be doing that shortly. Welcome, exactly. everyone, to Leafline. Exactly. Welcome, everyone. Christmas and preciseness is overrated. So welcome to Leafline. Glad you're here with us. Christmas is not overrated, Brian. Crispness oh, I misunderstood. is overrated. Get your blankets, your pillows. It's Leafline. We'll put you to sleep better than any sleep cure you could possibly find. Welcome in to our podcast. And uh, we have a mm, few updates for you. <laughs> Not really. I thought you were hesitating before saying, we have a great show for you. Hi, we have a great show for you. Uh, actually, we need to introduce ourselves. I am Brian Scott Ralston, and I am associate to the pastor here at Centenary Church now for 20.5 years. That's crazy. Wow. But, uh, actually, yeah, it's just the way it is. And across the room, six miles away, is Benjamin, Benjamin Scott Aquina. S- no, it isn't. Scott. Uh, okay, it? Benjamin. Uh, ben. I'm Ben. Yeah, he's Ben Aquina. Director of Modern Worship and All Things Nerd Related and many other tech ministries. Thanks for joining us. Can we get an update, please? Can I get an update? Can I get an update? I don't think there is any, but that's okay. Uh, Updates this week is (laughs) the fact that we're still continuing in virtual ministry mode. So please join us and come to... One thing I'm excited about is that by the time this podcast gets posted to YouTube... We will have had meetings on campus of our children's ministries and our youth ministries. Yay. And so if you have a time machine, I encourage you to go back and go to them if you have children of that appropriate age group. We tell you about this because it's signs of hope that with the weather easing a bit, the smoke clearing a bit, and just being able to use our courtyard again, um, we are having some outside gatherings with social distancing and all sorts of precautions but at least we're getting together for children's ministry and youth ministry. So that gives us hope that at some point we'll be able to do some other ministry outside as well. So stay tuned. And join a Vine group. Yeah, do that. Join a Vine group. There's five going and there'll be more to come. So join in. Recommendations. Give it a try. Brian, um, what you reading? What you listening to? You know, I am a bachelor boy right now. Kathy is away helping her parents in Arizona. So I've been listening to all sorts of stuff because I have no one to talk to around the house and I'm so lonely. Not really. Uh, It's been fine. And so I've been listening to a lot of books uh, and a lot of podcasts again. And, you know, this is what I do. I rotate between different weird books like some Stephen Ambrose and those of you who know your history. He's written a bunch of histories, not only World War II, but... Uh, the American uh, Exploration, uh, so the Undaunted Courage, the Lewis and Clark book. I've kind of reread parts of that again recently, and then I'm into my fiction mode still where I'm reading a bunch of Jeffrey Deaver. If you've ever read him, he's suspense and just really good, uh, I guess, mysteries for the most part. And then I've been reading some biographies as always. So nothing exciting, but I love them. So yay. And as far as listening to podcasts, I'm still going through all my normal uh, history slash entertainment slash church related podcasts. I've mentioned them before, so I don't need to mention them right now. But there you go. My wife and I are still chipping away at the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, we are so relieved right now because we're halfway through phase two. That means we get to watch Captain America, the Winter Soldier. And it is just so gosh darn good. We are just loving every second of it. It's really, really refreshing after Iron Man 3 and Thor the Dark World. So. All those words mean certain things to a lot of people, and to people like my co-host, they mean absolutely nothing. Yep, I've just been thinking about the Winter Soldier, Brian. Dessert and Aren't lunch, you excited? and uh, just, just I, I'm not even listening right now. Okay. Sorry, hope you're not listening. No, I'm. Just well, I'm kidding. gonna make it up to you, Brian. Right now, my give it a try for the week is directly for you and your wife, because one of my favorite sitcoms of all time was recently added to Netflix. It is called Community. It is an insanely talented cast, wonderful writers. Uh, I think you and Kathy are all done with Parks and Recreation, right? At least your initial watch. Yes, through. we're all done with that show that I cannot ever get the title right, Recreation and Park, yes. or whatever it's called. Yeah, so maybe we will look out. Uh, I've heard Parks it, and Recreate. Good things about community. It's it's really wonderful. Um, just, yeah, one of the cast members went on to absurdly stunning success by comparison to his uh, his other castmates, a guy named Donald Glover, who... 
I think he's like halfway to an EGOT right now. He's just crazy talented. Um, and so if you are listening to this podcast and you love Chevy Chase and his classic movies of the 70s, you probably don't want to watch this show because he's on it and he's super disappointing. Yeah, he's really old now, isn't he? It's, it's pretty clear he didn't want to be on the show. <laughs> and so I, I feel like his character was just him showing up and saying what was on his mind. Yeah, and uh, sorry, I was distracted by EGOT. Is that some sort of weird Australian or New Zealand bird? Is no, that, that is – do you really not know this? No, it's an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar. Oh, you silly goose. I just was thinking that maybe other people aren't as nerdy as you and me. And yes, I identify – EGOT is my nerd. cousin from Romania, bro. Yes, I okay. I forgot I met him once. That's right. Okay. That's right. Good. All right. Moving on to whatever category comes next. Trivia. So category last week was rock legends. The question, everyone knows the four Beatles are John, Paul, George, and that other guy. But Ringo Starr was not the group's first drummer. What curly-haired Brit was the group's drummer from 1960 to 1962 before being kicked to the curb to make room for Ringo? So my favorite answer that came in, Ben forwards me some of your answers, (laughs) was from Beatles scholar and just all around... Good servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, Carrie Sampson. And she, she answered the question and then some. And then some. She basically gave us the entire backstory, which was very interesting. He was actually and, fired by the group's manager, which I think was kind of a lame move because Pete did a lot for that group during the uh, – yeah, It was so. great. It, I think she may be in contact with Pete's uh, relatives. I love getting to see people – show what they're passionate about and Carrie is passionate about the Beatles. And yeah, I Beatles that. history at least. Uh, and yeah. it was really kind of cool. So thanks for that. She's effort. not the only one that got it right. No. Big kudos to Joyce Uziak and Jeff Jacobs, who also got it correct. Joyce remarked very accurately that Pete was not the first drummer of the Beatles, but there were a few others that, that uh, went in and out. Um, and unfortunately, I think this is something that Carrie mentioned. Pete Best, even when he was recording for the Beatles, got replaced by a session drummer for a few of the recordings. Yep. Um, yes. There's so, a lot that could be said about Pete Best and his drumming, and it's amusing. But So just pulling the curtain back a minute on our podcast Uh-oh. here. Often Ben does not uh, – we don't discuss the trivia question ahead of time. He does a lot of work, and he comes up with the trivia questions. I sometimes uh, am not involved in that process. Many times I'm not involved in that. Uh-oh. Last week and many other weeks, Ben has just you know said the question, and I have not heard it yet. And most of the time I get the answers, but not this coming week, just so you know. The coming oh, yeah, trivia yeah, yeah. is about to happen – I did not get it correct. And so the I'm just category put is that out there. cinema parentage. Question. The year is 1960. Director John Sturgis releases a Western film featuring Yul Brynner, Eli Wallach, Steve McQueen, and Charles Bronson that becomes an instant classic, The Magnificent Seven. But many fans didn't realize that this Western film was actually a remake of an Eastern film that had come out six years earlier. What was that movie? And if you're a total dork like me, who directed it? And you know he's a total dork just by the voice he uses when reading the questions. I this is one of those questions that I kind of felt vaguely like I should know it, like it's familiar, sort of, kind of. And when Ben told me the answer, uh, yeah, okay, I vaguely remember knowing this at one point in my life, but I didn't know it. I didn't get it. So yeah, if you did get it, if I said that and a light bulb went off over your head, first off, don't. Stand under lamps because that's dangerous. And secondly, email us at centenary1911 at gmail.com. By the way, we now record this podcast on Tuesdays. So if you want to answer the trivia, please do so by Tuesday at 9 a.m. Otherwise, I may not read your name and I'll feel terrible. Story time because the lockdown is boring. Do we have a story? (sighs) we, We could just move on. We don't need to do a story every week. Let's not do it. Okay, let's not do it because I can't I, – I'm sure I could come up with one in like a minute, but why Why belabor? Brian, let's move on to the main topic. Main topic. Brian, why don't you take the lead on this? Okay. Uh, we're kind of doing a next step from last week's topic. When I suggested last week's main topic about resetting our, our sort of factory defaults and not approaching a situation and thinking about what we deserve – I suggested that we use this Bible verse, which I'm now going to read. Philippians chapter 2, 
do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. And this kind of, sorry to use the word, Brian, but this triggered my co-host because <laughs> he has heard a lot of people sort of misread and misapply this verse to their own lives. And while it's very important that we do exercise humility in our lives and we value others above ourselves, Brian, this often sort of leads people down a very dangerous slippery slope, doesn't it? Yeah, it's verse two, uh, chapter two, verse three. And if you go on in the, that next verse, verse four is pretty important too. Did we say Philippians? And I think I mentioned Philippians. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So Philippians continue. two, three, and four. But anyway, point being the Christian life is meant to be kind of a balance. And I think sometimes we get this out of balance. It's not about me. And that is true. But it's also not the other extreme where I am worth nothing. I am worth less. I am wretched. I am I'm a total train wreck and I'm not good for anything. And there is a view of yourself that I think is a balance of those two extremes. And I think it's the way God wants us to view ourselves, which is forgiven and free. And I like verse four of chapter two of Philippians, because if I'm not mistaken, Ben, and correct me here, but it says, look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. In other words, you are to, to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus, but there's a way you do that where you're also making sure you're taking care of yourself. You look not only to your own interests. Brian, what does this look like in real time when people do this incorrectly? Yeah. So what I've seen in um, many, many years in the church is I've seen an extreme version of people uh, devaluing themselves and essentially they play the martyr. And sometimes that is not an extreme way to talk about it where they think they are worth nothing and they just kind of let people walk all over them and sort of it's humiliation, not humble, not humility. And they get those two words confused. Those words are not in any way the same concept. So it's some people who kind of triumph and rejoice in thinking of themselves lower than a worm and never getting past the fact that they are a sinner. And while that is a, a definite reality, at some point you are saved by God's grace. You're saved by Jesus. He's forgiven you for those sins. And you don't want to forget the forgiveness, but you don't need to continue to uh, dwell and and kind of wallow in the wretchedness and the the pit in which you used to live. Because the scripture is very clear. That's what you used to be. You used to be darkness. You used to be sin. You used to be those things. Yes, you're no longer those things. So Brian, what's the attraction of dwelling on that? If it's so wrong, if it's so bad, why do people fall into this trap? Because there's something that feels feels right about it somehow. Like God wants me to be humble, quote unquote. It's a misunderstanding of the concept of humble. And they think, well, I shouldn't think too highly of myself. I shouldn't be thinking of myself ever. And thus, I need to go the other extreme, which is I always need to put uh, myself down and feel bad about myself. And and we've there are certain churches that actually emphasize this point that you are a wretched, horrific sinner, and you're just barely saved, and you better walk right you and do fill right. Up that offering plate. Yeah, you, 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 exactly. You better give your offerings and serve and all these things because you are hanging by a thread. And if you step out of line, there will be God has His finger on the smite button, and there'll be a lightning bolt that just gets you because you are just a wretched sinner, and God's and barely one of the theologically you. squidgy things about that viewpoint is that it paints a very weak picture of the redemptive saving power that right. Jesus provides. Right, right, exactly. If, if you really are that, then Jesus, His power to redeem humanity must be very limited, indeed. Right, and that's the problem with it. When you start analyzing it, it. It devalues the work of Jesus, the redemptive work that he accomplished. It devalues what the Father says about us. In Christ, we are new creations. We are declared to be God's masterpiece in Ephesians 2.10. That's post-salvation. So this is not, I'm, I'm not trying to you know, bump up human self-esteem on We do on its need own. Jesus. You need Jesus. Redemption. It's pretty clear. But look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It's pretty clear. It's by grace you are saved through faith. And we talk about that. And then verse 10, you're declared to be in Christ, a masterpiece, God's best creation. And then you do good works that he's planned in advance for you. But there's a value that comes in right there where you are declared to be righteous and through no work of your own, you are declared to be a masterpiece and you need to live like that, getting your self-esteem and your value from what God says about you, not what the world says and not what you say about you either. And again, not forgetting, you know, necessarily your past, 
but understanding your forgiveness and remembering the forgiveness part more than you remember the wretched sinnerness of it all. Uh, but again, there are churches out there that want you to stay in that wretched sin condition because somehow that that teaching feels holy when it's really not. It's actually just a, a warped it's view. The, it's an erroneous kind of holiness. Yeah. It's, it's a holiness that only looks at half of the picture scripture paints of the followers of Christ. Right. And I, I've known too many people who get stuck there. And while they talk a lot about the love of God and talk a lot about it and believe it, definitely, it hasn't internalized to them declaring they it about themselves. They find it themselves. easier to believe that God can love Hitler than that God could love me. Yeah. Because uh, everyone doesn't know the darkness of my heart. You don't know the extent of my sin. You don't know how awful I am. And if you did, then you would realize God's forgiveness can help you, but it can't help me. Right, right. And it's it's shortchanging the grace of God in a weird way. And and you may even understand that you're saved, but you're kind of walking with this constant awareness that, boy, one little slip up and God's going to throw you off his team. He can barely tolerate your presence now as it is. And if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, you wouldn't even be in God. That's not the way it works. You're declared to be forgiven and free. And, and that's where you need to get your security from and then operate from that and identity. Position. Your identity. That is your identity. Exactly right. And what Philippians 2 is calling us to is a way of living where we do deny ourselves, yes, but don't stop there. Take up your cross means you have a mission, you you sacrifice for a purpose. It's not just sacrificing because you're humiliating yourself and you're a terrible person, so you deserve to be last. No, it's understanding you, you have a mission, so you take up your cross and you follow Jesus. And his example is humility, where from a position of strength, you know who you are, you know who you belong to, you know whose you are, and then you choose to take a lower position. That's, you look not only to your own interests, but the interests of others. You do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, yes, but you also make sure that you're properly valuing yourself because Jesus died for you, and there's there's a real significance there. Then you need, you need to self-care, and all those things are so important, and Jesus himself took rest. Jesus took time off. Jesus tried to live in the, the rhythms and the seasons of life in a way that we need to follow. And if Jesus needs to do it, so do we. And then, but you don't just stop with taking care of yourself. You need to go beyond that and humble yourself to extend life to others too. I'm rambling, but you know, I'm pretty passionate about this, obviously. Should I mention the worship thing? Yes. Okay. So this is a trap that I fell into for some years as not just a worship leader, but also as a worship songwriter, I wrote many songs that I really, really liked that were on this very subject of what a horrible, irredeemable, disgusting sinner I am. And it it came to my attention a few years later, I think, Brian, through actually my relationship with you and through just learning stuff from you that like it's really, really dangerous to spend our time of worship singing about that kind of thing. And it's there's an attraction to it. Yes. There's a self-indulgence to it. There's something poetic about being the worm, about groveling, about identifying with the uh, – when the Pharisee and the tax collector are both praying in the temple, you know, the tax collector's point of view in, in that story is is held up as the right point of view, but that tax collector has not yet been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Right. According to scripture, I have been washed by the blood of Christ and I am pure. So why do you take something that is pure and pretend that it's filthy? It's not. Right. If if I can sit there in a time of worship and grovel and talk about how much I'm I'm terrible, then I'm misreading scripture. I'm right. I am misappraising myself and I'm not appraising myself the way Christ looks at me. But in our effort to not be the Pharisee in that story, we go to the other extreme and and try to identify too much with the tax collector. Yeah. And that's, I think, a struggle that is very common in the church. And the reality is... When we're not supposed to model ourselves after either of these people. We're supposed no. to model ourselves after Christ. Exactly. Exactly. I always go back to uh, everybody's favorite hymn, The Amazing Grace. Uh, John Newton, the guy that wrote it, the first verse, you know, he talks about himself being a wretch. And that's exactly what he was. He was a slaver. He was this horrific person. He made sailors blush. He was so bad and so sinful and so, but that's not where the song, you know, ends. There's, there's verses that go far beyond that to show what the grace of God does. Yes, it saves you from, from your sin. It saves a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. But then you go on, there's, there's many other verses that talk about this grace in your life and how you're, uh, you know, redeemed and you're holding on to uh, the Lord's promises and you're holding on to the ability to get past sin and you're, 
you know, ultimately you're, you're in forever with, with the Lord. And so there's a journey that you should go on and you don't want to get stuck in verse one. You don't want to get stuck in that wretchedness because it goes beyond that. But yes, there are worship songs all over the place that spend far too much time and hymns, classic hymns too, that spend too much time on the, I'm a worm, I'm a wretched, wretched sinner. And that's a good place to be if you still need salvation. And it's a good place to be when you're a young believer, just to remember what it was like. But as you grow in your faith, you remember the forgiveness. You don't need to remember the sinfulness. Yeah, there is this other side of the coin where you read that work about, oh, we are God's masterpiece. Well, I'm God's masterpiece. I'm doing pretty great on my... Mm-hmm. No, no, no. You mm-hmm. are God's masterpiece after he works on you. Right now, you're a hunk of wood. Exactly. It's that balance in between the two. You don't take the grace of God for granted. You don't grow accustomed to it. You don't use it as a license to sin. But you also don't need to stay in that place of brokenness and darkness where you once were darkness and you once were broken. No. Now, in the hands of the master carpenter, the master creator, the master you know, artist, you become a masterpiece because God's working on you. So what I talked about uh, a while back, the... Uh, The idea that Jesus accepts us and he accepts us just as we are, yes, but he loves us so much to not want us to stay like that. So we're constantly under construction and he's making something new of us. And that process is part of it, letting go of your past. He's forgiven you for your sins. You need to forgive yourself of your sins as well and not stay in that identity of who you used to be. That's not who you are. You're a son or daughter of of God. Now you need to live like that. And that's not a reason for arrogance or overconfidence, but it's also not a reason for humiliation or undervaluing yourself. So we mentioned this earlier, but the concept of identity and in Christ, you have a new identity. And that's an important reality because I think it's from where we get uh, the balance that we need to live in here. The idea of you are, you are saved, you are forgiven and free and you need to live like it. So there's a lot of verses in the scripture that talk about that. The one that we're going to highlight is from Colossians 1, 21 and 22. I'll I'll start a little bit before that to put it in context. Colossians 1, starting in verse 20. So Colossians uh, chapter 1, verses 19 and beyond. And Ben's going to read a couple of verses. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ and his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Brothers and sisters, if you've been redeemed by Christ, that is the way God sees you. And that's the important reality that you need to now believe it yourself. And I think that's where we often fall down is sometimes spiritual traditions or family backgrounds or whatever cause us to not get that. And that is what the scripture declares is what God declares o- over you. If you're in Christ, this is, this is the reality and you need to live like it and believe it. And that's where the security comes from. It's not a self-confidence. It's a Christ confidence that your, your status, your identity, who you are now is because of what Jesus has accomplished and what God has declared to be true. And what the Holy Spirit is is witnessing to, you know, in every believer. So that's where we find the balance. It's not through some self-help guru or anything garbage. It's that that's the reality. Who you are in Christ now is what that, you know, is so significant in the scripture there and many other scriptures. So brothers and sisters, dig into that and live like it. Here, here. One last word before we go. Closing reminders. We do want to ask you to consider joining a Vine group if you haven't already. We want to ask you to communicate with us at the email address that y'all know or put some comments on the YouTube channel and uh, share with a friend what's going on in your life. Encourage a believer, a friend, a neighbor, just because it's good to be talking to each other during this difficult time and make sure we stay connected. Bye. Bye for now.